We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take your own advice. What happens? I tell you what happens. Blam! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No collusion! Shit's get way too complicated for me. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCann. And this is Jeremy Rothko Show. All right. Recently in part one of our tw- uh, coverage news roundup surrounding the events of the 2022 uh, midterm elections here in the United States, we started getting into the topic of pollsters. And from our conversation on pollsters, we started reading from uh, Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson, which dealt with uh, the role of some of the um, the Arthur Finkelstein network of operatives who have gone into the, the polling business and com- with the focus on Tony Fabrizio. And so we started reading from um, Proof of Conspiracy Chapter 4, and we're going to pick up on what we were reading there. And in addition to um, the Fabrizio, Finkelstein, uh, Birnbaum style of a uh, operatives of people involved significantly with polling and uh, that whole business, we're also going to be getting back into elements of the 11-9 cover-up. So we're going to pick up where we left off from part one of our midterm analysis uh, news roundup and get back into um, proof of conspiracy with what we were discussing uh, previously with regards to this angle around Finkelstein Birnbaum network, and then also back into elements of the uh, 11-9 uh, 2016 um, cover-up and all of the, um, many of the geopolitical elements surrounding it. And there, I, I think that more and more I'm becoming aware of how little is really known, uh, even amongst like fairly like independently researched and educated groups of people about how real and how high level this uh, 11-9 transnational conspiracy really was in relationship to, at the very least, elements of the 2016 elections, but most especially in terms of the manufacturing of the what, what became then known as the MAGA movement. And, and and also in following up in terms of the ongoing and continuing to escalate, uh, yay, uh, Trump situation, yay, walking out on the Tim Pool show uh, with his uh, hanger-ons there of uh, Milo Yiannopoulos and, uh, and Nick Fuentes and the question of they and all of that. That this is really, once again, this is so obvious, the vacuum at the center of almost all of this discourse is, first of all, the obvious political weaponization of what's actually going on surrounding all of the discourse around Ye, but even Ye specifically, where he continues even once again saying he supports Trump. He really supports Trump, and even though Trump has lied about him, he knew the background of Trump, Trump lies. That's sort of another washing in some way of Trump. But but then Ye goes again on Tim Pool saying he supports Trump. So you would you would think that if the whole conflagration is about uh, talking about Jews, you might want to, you know, start talking about the fact that the uh, the then leader of the Jewish state at that point, Bibi Netanyahu. Crucial player, crucial player, crucial player in the backing of Trump, obviously way back, but then a crucial player in the 11-9 operation itself, directly linked into the ongoing political networks that uh, in the United States that are uh, working the angles on the uh, Trump-DeSantis split potentially, and obviously the core in a domestic capacity, you might have to say at the institutional level, is somewhere in the realm of the institution of the Council for the National Policy and then the political operations surrounding Arthur Finkelstein, his company, and and his network of, uh, of political operatives, including these so-called pollsters, right? 
But then there's Bibi Netanyahu, key operative in helping put in Ye's guy, Trump. And yet still, I think Ye said Zionist for the first time. It was totally, did, totally politically disconnected. It sounded like he was just sort of slipping into a question of, you know, using Zionist as a replacement for, uh, as a more politically comfortable replacement for Jew. It sort of sounded like, in a way, it did not sound politically connected. And I still haven't heard him say the word Israel. Maybe he has. It's very strange. You might think there's, you know, one Jewish state. It's very controversial. It's the probably one of the, if there's a single state that there's a, this intense relationship over the uh, over the course of modern American political history. It's got to be Israel, and its leader, who said also be to the king, sort of who's the it's the battle of the king of the Jews. Is it Trump or is it Bibi Netanyahu, the prime minister? It's the the debate hasn't been settled yet. And and yet there's there even those who are wary of the yay operation in general still don't seem to have the basic facts of like, yeah, Netanyahu really was part of the 119 operation, helped put Trump in alongside these domestic elements that continue on with the uh, weaponized uh, war on culture operations. And then also combined with the highest levels of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin uh, Zayed, and then uh, and then the highest levels of the Saudi government, Mohammed bin Salman, and then all linked back into the highest levels of the Russian government in terms of this, uh, you know, to- total involvement of uh, of Putin and the and the Russian state apparatus in that operation. Additionally. Now, those are some political uh, facts that could really start the conversation about what's actually going on here around uh, this weaponized conversation that's uh, taken about, you know, who's they. It's all uh, hinges on who they are. Let's talk about let's not talk about they. Let's talk about people and states and institutions that have names. And let's talk about politics and political power. All right. And so I think more and more, the 11-9 operation is almost covered up more than the 9-11 operation, I'm beginning to think. And it's way more um, confusing to some extent. And so I think it's, especially at this time, it's really helpful to get back into some of the basic facts of, and this is just the overt uh, elements of the intersection of, of, uh, of the Trump campaign with Israel, the UAE, Saudi, the Saudis, and the Russians, uh, all back into these domestic elements. And, and I, more and more, I think this is crucial to understand because it keeps playing. It's, this has not stopped. This continues to play out. But we're in, a place where, we're in a place where people are denying that 9-11 happened, that 9-11 even happened. And it's almost like people are like not even, you know, in a place of not even understanding the post 9-11 era and understanding the rise of the uh, U.S. Uh, domestic police and surveillance state, the rise of the, uh, you know, in that case, it was the terror wars. Now we're talking about the rise of the culture wars, that ha- all that has really deeply weaponized political implications. So... I, that's why I think that we have a duty to continue to come back to some of the basics of, of, the, of the facts of the 11-9 operation, uh, even if we're going to be called 11-9 truthers or whatever. I don't care. I think, we, I think it's really a, a crucial thing um, to, to understand. And not only are the individuals, some of the networks exactly the same people. The crime ministers returned to power just recently and brought in an even crazier and even more psychotic and, uh, criminal, uh, and supremacist and racist crew, uh, violent crew with him. Um, so that would suggest that we're actually in a place of escalation of the 11-9 operation, and partially because there's so little actual uh, deep cultural and political awareness that it even happened. So that's, that's, that's my personal uh, 
incentive, I think, that I'm feeling right now in terms of why we got to keep coming back to 11-9. Um, I could not agree with you more. It's of, of vital importance because just the, for so many reasons, including what you stated there. And also um, regarding uh, Ye and the Zionist, I guess he does tend to throw that term around time, from time to time, not very prominently, but um, I, in the uh, controversial Drink Champs interview, um, he made reference to Kim Kardashian and Pete Davidson. Um, he wrote, he, this is what he said. Uh, so this is just an example of how he throws the term Zionist out there, but it's not done with any type of meaning or understanding of what it might be. But you'll see an example of it here. I'm just going to read this real quick. Um, Kim is a Christian on TMZ. I just saw it yesterday. It said Pete Davidson and Kim had sex by the fireplace to honor their grandmother. It's Jewish Zionists that's about that life. That's telling this Christian woman that has four black children to put that out as a message in the media. So when I drive by and I see the Hulu ads and I see the J.P. Morgan Chase ads, I'm going to let you all know right now, the devil is a defeated foe. You can't poison me. So that's an example of Jewish Zionists who push this message. No type of attempt to like try to like give like an idea or an understanding of what a Zionist is. It's just thrown out there as this term that ultimately is – that there's no real meaning behind it's just thrown out there in the context of a discussion about how the jews do things it's the it's the zionists that are that are destroying my family by my ex-wife having sex with an actor of jewish descent i mean it's just so it's done in just a nonsensical way and now um with yay now aligning it looks like increasingly with the nick fuentes the evolution of that term or devolution of that term going forward the evolution or de-evolution will be interesting to see but that's just an example of him using the term zionist in just a totally meaningless way that accomplishes nothing and his now his current lackeys or you know wannabe handlers or hangers on or whatever uh the sort of fascist f-word milo and uh, and Nick Fuentes, they are not going to help him actually develop some kind of ac- some credible, uh, constructive, uh, insightful, uh, you know, rhetoric that will actually help him make his point. Actually, I think. Yeah, uh, I think de de evolution was the right term to use in terms of how that will go in the future with. Yeah, in Fuentes, so de de evolution, indeed. Yeah, and so this there the at a certain level, Ye would have done better to actually pay a little bit more attention to what he sort of sees as maybe the left critical woke black mob in certain ways, in terms of the more academic strains who have done who have actually developed very strong ways of uh, speaking about and critically analyzing uh, power networks, right? And that's another thing. I don't believe I still haven't heard him use the phrase Jewish power. Even one of Tim Pool's like lackeys uh, after Ye left the left the scene said I, she, she was like, I thought we were going to you know, there was at least going to be a conversation and Ye was going to be able to, you know, discuss his issues with Jewish power. Ye has still I don't believe used the phrase. It'd be a helpful phrase. Because even in like as they begin to get caught up uh, early on, if this whole thing was not just some kind of operation, I don't not sure it was. I think that I actually think Ye uh, sussed out Tim Pool and the whole situation. Maybe he even began to feel like set up by his own, you know, uh, by Milo and and Nick themselves at some level. Uh, and uh, and if 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 Ye is like has a real strong grip on like uh, clarity. I would say it's almost always around some kind of um, emotional intelligence. And so I think he sussed out the scene and was like, I got, I got to get out of here. But meanwhile, it, they started talking about like, uh, you know, it was obvious from their pre-show discussions that Tim Pool had brought up the idea that if Ye ran for president, he would do well with the, uh, the black voters or something like that, the black voting bloc. Uh, and, and so then Ye brought that back up. It was like, well, you just, you know, people talk about the, you know, the black voters, you know, and that we're allowed to talk in that way. So why can't I throw a net over, over, you know, a, a, a grouping? And of course you could, people talk about the Jewish vote, the black vote, the Jewish vote. You could, that's that you could do that. Right. 
Then you just then if you want to talk about power, a power dynamic, which is what he's really trying to expose. And in certain ways, he's doing, uh, you know, pieces of work to actually expose uh, highly weaponized and illegitimate and uh, in some cases very violent uh, power networks, some of which directly interface with him and, uh, and have tried to control him and have uh, assaulted him in many ways. And, and so that, that's his personal vendetta here that I think is very just and very righteous. And he keeps getting caught up and not being able to actually just talk about this accurately. Right. So, yeah, you talk, you can talk about a, uh, the Jewish voters. You can talk about the black voters. Right. In general, there is a, a generalized understanding that we don't talk about the whites. We don't talk about the blacks as such. Now, people will do that, but it's usually an indicator that there is a, uh, a generalization going on that can head in the realm of, uh, of you know, bigotry or stereotyping that's cloaking and that's sort of like throwing a net over an entire group of people when you're actually trying to talk about something specific, like in a political context, you're talking about a voting block or the way that uh, Jewish voters might tend to vote or black voters might tend to vote, right? So then you just start using terms that are accurate, right? And so if he just started using that term and started separating it out and being like, look, I, you know, I've talked about the Jews. Maybe that's not the best way to talk about it, but it's not, I don't mean the, the Jews. I don't mean the whole Jews. I'm talking about some specific network of power where there are is organized power interests and dynamics that are working uh, in a negative fashion. And I want to deal with it and we need to deal with it. And so, so just the, the, that kind of wording, you know, would help things, but the, of course not. And that, I think that is then match the fact that the phrase Jewish power is not being used by him and his lackeys is combined with the fact that there's no political content here, which is then paralleled by the lack of the use of, uh, an actual state entity that is said to represent, that is said to be the Jewish state, that is said to represent the interests of the Jewish people worldwide, that the Jewish people worldwide, as even Trump himself said, basically the Jews in America don't support him enough for having supported the Jewish state. Thus, we're basically traitorous Jews or something like that, you know. Uh, and so there is some political content there, especially since the actual individual who was at the top of that actual uh, power structure with a name, such as Israel, such as Benjamin Netanyahu, were crucial players in putting his boy Trump into power alongside a whole bunch of other uh, networks of power that should then, when understood together, in relationship to the war on culture that he is now participating in, to some extent, I think subconsciously, unconsciously, in other ways to for his own potential benefits and other ways uh, that I believe that he will potentially make some progress on if he can shake these assholes around him. Um, but maybe not, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe he sort of, you know, marked out his path for too long here. I don't know. But there would be a potential to actually have a really helpful and constructive conversation right now. Um, and yeah. so let, we should get to it. Yeah, and the other thing, and I'll just reiterate this that we talked about in part two of our um, election uh, midterm uh, news roundup is that, uh, that uh, Nick Fuentes is more concerned, it seems like, could very well be another Richard Spencer in that, like, it's, um, you know, his quote unquote criticism of Israel ultimately becomes um, get out of America and go over there so we can set up our own white Zionist Catholic, uh, just Catholic instead of Jewish uh, white Zionist dreamland here in America. So I mean, that very well could be where we're headed to. And if that's the case, then that's very, I would think, um, in symmetry with the uh, more hardline push in Israel among uh, the more um, hardline elements of a uh, religious uh, Zionism uh, gaining more and more traction over there. So that very well could be what's going on. And I mean, yeah, it could just be a total, I don't know if he's totally oblivious to any, I don't, I don't know where, I don't even want to begin to try to identify his mental state, but that very well could be what's going on here, which would make even 
starting talking about Zionists under the umbrella of Nick Fuentes influence even more problematic if that's what Fuentes is uh, angle is regardless of what Fuentes angle is it's just not helpful and it's not going to be helpful and um, it's a very unfortunate situation actually I think I think it would be really fair to say that this is evolving or devolving into what you would call a Christian Zionist operation that's what you what you were actually seeing there with that triplicate of Milo Ye and uh, and Nick Fuentes actually and it, it's it's a and in, you know in certain cases it's a white Christian Zionist uh, operation. I think that there's elements of uh, Fuentes and Milo that are are you know tend towards white Christian Zionists of some sort. Um, but Ye is part of it too, in that it's actually they are talking about make America Christian again is like the lingo I think that's behind it, maca, and it's not the South American adapt- adaptogenic. Herb. It's like uh, it's sort of like re-upping MAGA into a, you know, a, as Fuente said, we need a, a cog, not a jog. We need a Catholic occupied government. Right. That And and so th- that is sort of what's on on display here. Right. Is Christian scientism uh, using, uh, you know, the the question of anti-Semitism as a cudgel is what it appears to be. All serving powerful political ends is what it really is uh, looking um, like. So, and we've seen Fuentes uh, on, you know, on certain clips of his video saying that he actually represents the good white uh, Christian Zionist cop to the potential bad actual sort of the implication is actually like a ha- a rehashing of a, a nazification uh bad cop for the Jews in his case is the way he would put it he's like you're going to be wishing for the days where you're just dealing with me and that in that case i think that that's right greg in terms of like the these the richard more the richard spencer kind be like there doesn't have to be, you know, uh, Auschwitz. They just have to be, you know, get get them off to their, you know, somewhere else or something like that. Or get at the very least, let we're going to occupy the government rather than them. But there's a sort of a sense of like, get them out of here, get them over there. And of course, who's always used anti-Semitism, quote unquote, anti-Semitism to try to drive Jews worldwide to Palestine? Now, now called Israel, the Zionists, the Zionist political movement. That's that's who, that's who, that's the longest term operation we know of. Who the origins, the modern, you know, public quote unquote philosophers, of people like Herzl. That's who. That's who wants to drive the Jews from around the world to occupied Palestine, now called Israel. Right. And so Fuente sets himself up as the I'm the I'm the good cop. White Christian Zionist, you don't want to deal with the bad ones. It all sounds like a Zionist operation to me. I don't know. But uh, all right. Just uh, just to wrap up this. uh, Realm of conversation here, this little tangent here, um, just I just go back to the ostensibly uh, polar opposite enemies, um, Charlie Kirk of Turning Point USA and Nick Fuentes, the Groyper movement, which is the thorn in the side of Turning Point and the um, conservative ink, as they call it, with their Zionism and all this and their advocacy for Israel. And both Charlie Kirk and Nick Fuentes were at the very least involved with getting people to um, Washington, D.C. for January 6th in the lead up to it and on the events thereof. So, I mean, that's a interesting. There could very well just be full circle just coming back to here. And who knows with uh, Fuentes and the question of all this Bitcoin money he received, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I believe, and uh, his very meteoric rise to prominence at such a young age. I mean, who who really knows here? I mean, we have, um, you know, Charlie Kirk, his bank rolling and all that. But I mean, there very well could just be something going on here. And you just see where the agendas in other areas are very similar. So who's not to say there's some type of um, operation going on here? I mean, it's speculate speculatory, but I mean, I think it's healthy and um, 
worthwhile speculation well, because we, there's we something know, very odd going on. We know there's an operation going on here, Greg. We now know out of the words, at least Ye told us the origins here of the, at the very least, this format of the uh, of the Ye operation. Let's call it. We now know that it was Alex Jones's uh, operation that uh, hooked him up with Milo, who then hooked him up with Fuentes. So we know this is, at the very least, an Alex Jones operation, which is an operation. And it looks more and more like it's actually probably a Roger Stone operation, which then makes me have to, you know, point out the obvious issues of, like, what's going on? This is not only some kind of alleged, like, sort of neo, uh, you know, Christian, white Christian Zionist nationalism uh, apparently going on, but it's sort of two sexually questionable guys sort of flanking yay in the middle of this. And this all goes then back to what we pointed out in terms of when Roger Stone came on the scene and Milo in like the heyday of the rise of MAGA with Alex Jones and, and Roger Stone started making Alex Jones feel uncomfortable on his own airwaves about how they were really going to party with Milo later or something like that. What was going on, Greg, with all of that? My recollection was that I don't know, it's not as easy to find the clips as it once would have been with the Alex Jones shows from that time being memory hold to a large extent because of the removal of all the material from YouTube and other social media. But my recollection is, is that Milo and Roger Stone were in the studio with Alex. They may have painted the studio pink for this too. I'm not, I don't, I'm not positive about that detail, but there was a time when Milo was in the studio where I believe things were painted pink, but um, may or may not be this particular circumstance, but on um, w- one of these shows back in, I think, the 2017 time period, I think uh, Roger Stone and Milo were talking about their exploits with other males. Um, and, I, and, that, and Alex was like, uh, I got the sense that Alex Jones, from what I could recall, was, um, <laughs> there, was an un- there was a there was a discomfort around this because on one hand, you know, Alex Jones has his pseudo evangelical conservative info warrior audience who tunes in, who um, looks down on the lifestyle. But then also, like, I can't upset Roger Stone and Milo. They're in the studio with me. So uh, that was what was going on. There was like this discussion of um, of same sex sexual exploits, interracial same sex sexual exploits. That's what I, I'm calling this from memory, but that's what, um, that was the context that we're referring to here, I believe. And Alex was not very comfortable with that. That's what I recall. In a quote unquote, sort of a libertine kind of way. And what the, at the time we pointed out that there's this, there's a spiritual compromise, both in terms of not only Trump as a, you know, credibly accused uh, rapist of girls at the very least, uh, you know, being sold as the great Christian savior in the United States, but also this whole question of Roger Stone coming into the Alex Jones movement and then that being the, the quote-unquote libertine, uh, you know, after-hours aspect of it being floated to Alex Jones's audience. There was some kind of like, uh, there was a, uh, you know, a spiritual, uh, you know, uh, compromise operation playing itself out and now the thing is now now milo is not just he's not some kind of like just a proud gay man no even when he was uh you know was said to be gay he was sort of like justifying his own uh abuse encounters uh had been justifying apparently uh like sort of like the age a lower age of consent uh, and, and now he's apparently, uh, at least he sort of seems to be on the surface. He's some kind of misogynist British imperial fascist. It, none of it sort of holds together. And then Nick, this is just a lot of issues there. There's a lot of chatter in the background of what is all going on there. Um, so I don't want to dwell on that, but I just wanted to point that out in terms of this whole, there's something very, there's real something weird about the nature of this current, uh, Troika, yay Troika, the, 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 uh, make America Christian Zionist again, Moxa. Um, yeah, well, oh, just, um, and on that, on that note, the last thing I'll say here is that, um, Milo also weaponized his, um, then proud, uh, 
um, uh, gayness at the time um, when after the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando in 2016, he kissed Gavin McInnes while saying fuck – or Gavin McInnes, I believe, said fuck Islam while they – locked lips and right. kissed and some type of public photo op. So that's even back then he was using his um he was using his um ge- his um gender association as far as um his uh sexual preference to vilify and uh demonize uh, Islam even this is back in 2016 the lead up to the election so and this the, the there was also the, this is the same time there was Israeli flags flying at his like uh his condo parties and and all of that. And remember that this is also this was part of the operation. Remember, Peter Thiel actually played a crucial role in the 11-9 operation in terms of the culture war aspect of it, and that he was said to be like the the uh, uh, gay supporter of Trump. And then remember, after Pulse Nightclub also, that this was being, like you're talking about, Greg, this was being run like, this is very also very Israeli-sounding Zionist propaganda uh, in terms of the the you know uh, sort of embra- saying f Islam while we're well, well, we're the protectors I'm... of uh, gay culture in the Middle East or something like that, and then Trump was said to be like a good protector of the uh, of the gay community in the United States. Well, at the time of that photo, um, Gavin McInnes was uh, on assignment for Rebel Media, and Milo was the Breitbart tech editor. So there you go. There you go. The death, it all goes back to the Death Star, I guess, too. All right. Okay, now let's get into some political facts about what who did what during uh, the uh, 11-9 operation, and specifically 2016, the run-up to the uh, so-called election. All right. All right, page 186. I think I might be starting uh, back one paragraph that we read before, but it, it gives context. So if we've read this before, I apologize, but I think it, we should do it. All right, page 186, a proof of conspiracy, how Trump's international collusion is threatening American democracy by Seth Abramson. And uh, the front cover has uh, circular photographs of uh, Mohammed bin Zayed from the UAE, uh, Vladimir Putin from Russia, Donald Trump from the United States, Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia, and Benjamin Netanyahu, the crime minister of Israel then and now. All right. Quote, during the same 48-hour period in March 2016 in which Donald Trump meets with his National Security Advisory Committee for the first time, Paul Manafort and Rick Gates pitched Trump on bringing aboard Fabrizio an employee of Finkelstein and Birnbaum, and Gates meets with Birnbaum in Washington. The two men discuss whether Birnbaum, with his, quote, close ties to current and former Israeli government officials, unquote, can link up the Trump campaign with Psy Group. Gates quotes requests proposals from Psy Group's Joel Zemel to create fake online identities, to use social media manipulation and to gather intelligence to help defeat Clinton, according to interviews and copies of the proposals, unquote. According to the New York Times, quote, the documents show that a senior Trump aide, Trump's deputy campaign manager, saw the promise of a digital disruption effort to swing voters in Mr. Trump's favor, unquote. Because it is Birnbaum, the quote-unquote senior aide to Netanyahu, who had previously co-managed one of the Israeli prime minister's campaigns and who the Times of Israel notes has, quote, closely worked with a wide range of Israeli politicians over the years, unquote, who makes the gates Zamel introduction. Gates and Birnbaum's late March 2016 meeting bears many of the hallmarks of an attempt by a foreign power to tamper in the 2016 election through a trusted intermediary. Indeed, the chief identification the Times of Israel gives to Finkelstein and Birnbaum is as quote-unquote long-time Netanyahu advisors. Unquote. Just, of course, the background here. This is, remember, Finkelstein was still alive. Finkelstein looks like he was brought in directly at this time to mainstream Trump into the heart of the GOP when it was still a little bit tough and you had like even like the... uh, the Lindsey Graham's, uh, you know, pushing back, saying if we do, if we accept this guy, this will be the end of us, and 
all of that, Ted Cruz, all of them, and to, you know, until they bent and uh, kiss, kiss the ring. Um, and then Finkelstein is definitely, you know, he, he, he helped install Netanyahu the first time in uh, 1996. And then in Birnbaum, his guy, then sort of ends up being this close, uh, you know, his, his Rama, Netanyahu's Rama manual, basically, is what, what it sounds like. Right. And there's actually a very interesting, there's a lot of um, more international stuff surrounding Birnbaum in terms of maybe the, the high tech, the cyber uh, aspect and connections there that we will have to return to um, another time. And then another point here is that, that, that who's not, I don't believe is brought in here is another Arthur Finkelstein protege, uh, John McLaughlin, who was actually working directly for Netanyahu as a quote unquote pollster when he then uh, came over to work directly for as a quote unquote pollster for the Trump campaign. All right, so this is replete. This Netanyahu highest levels of the Israeli government uh, uh, connection here with the the core of some of the Trump operation uh, is obvious, and uh, and uh, it's not it's it was not just quote unquote Israel Gate instead of Russia Gate, and of course all these kinds of gate examples are usually simplifications and cover-ups of the the depth and the breadth of uh, these kinds of deep operations. All right, back to the text, bottom of page 186 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, The possibility that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu sought to tamper with America's 2016 presidential election is a grave one requiring some consideration not only of whether it was within uh, his power, but in the character of the man to do so. Apropos of this inquiry, in 2018, Israeli police will recommend not just once or twice, but three times that Netanyahu face criminal charges for, quote, taking bribes, fraud, and breach of trust, unquote, allegations that ultimately do lead to Netanyahu becoming the first sitting Israeli prime minister to face criminal charges, see chapter 10. Unquote. Just a quick reminder here. That, you remember during the sort of end of the Trump years, I think it was, when Alex Jones was on air basically saying that the, uh, you know, the attack on Trump was mirrored by the attack on, on Netanyahu because they're nationalists. George Soros hates them. It's a, it's a fake political attack by the liberals. You know, um, he, he was doing that. Trump, Netanyahu, and Putin were the uh, troika of nationalist heroes that were out to be destroyed. And I guess they only became the duo after Netanyahu's vaccine policy and uh, Netanyahu turning on Trump. But at the time, they were the trio, the troika, so to speak, in Alex Jones's view. And then at once, once, uh, and then once Alex began to say uh, Trump was bad for the. Uh, for his role in the jab and continuing to defend it, in addition to then Netanyahu, then Alex pointed to Bolsonaro as the leading uh, nationalist worldwide, and of course it's Bolsonaro's, uh, you know, one of his sons wearing the Mossad T-shirt and all of that kind of stuff, and that's just the very edge of it. So you had you had Alex Jones defending Netanyahu in a very similar way as he was defending Trump. And he was defending Trump from the actual 11-9 investigation, right? So that is very interesting, and, and especially since Alex used to say bad things about Netanyahu. He never would credibly finger Netanyahu as, I would say, the you know most credibly accused central architect of the September 11th operation, very likely over many years, maybe even decades, I think you got to say going back all the way to his crucial role in the Jerusalem conference in 1979, which is the quote unquote intellectual birthing of the concept of the war of the sort of the war on terror, the age of terror, Tewa, you know, that would be Barack, uh, who Barack, remember these two guys, the Sayeret Matkal, uh, Israeli special forces uh, behind enemy lines, commandos, Ehud Barak, he Epstein, Guy uh, Barack is, is said to have met Epstein via the, the probably one of the fathers of the Israeli nuclear program and a key uh, Maxwell 
Robert Maxwell guy, uh, Shimon Perez. Uh, so you have Yehud Barak on television on September 11th. He's in he's in uh, on television on British airwaves, uh, basically laying out the vision of the war on terror, the war on terror, um, and uh, you know. Uh, Forces, especially American forces, uh, all around the world on the ground, uh, seeking out the terrorists who threaten our our uh, society, our entire Western way of life, society, and all that. Right. So you have that guy, and then you have Netanyahu. His actually Ehud Barak was Netanyahu's commander uh, in Sayeret Matkal, the uh, Israeli Special Forces Reconnaissance Unit. These are like the twin pillars of the 9-11 operation, I think you got to say, uh, you know, both with backgrounds in uh, special forces, uh, Israeli military intelligence, both uh, prime ministers. Uh, and uh, so there you have Alex Jones doing a parallel defense of the 11-9 operation sort of guy. I wouldn't say Trump's the architect of 11-9, but he's the core player in the 11-9 operation. Uh, from he, Alex Jones is fraudulently publicly defending him from the 11-9 investigation, the public 11-9 investigation, the public inquiry. And then at the same time, he's then defending the, the, the sort of central character, I would assert, in the 9-11 operation, Netanyahu as uh, being the uh, target of, of uh, you know, political foes in terms of these mul- uh, multiple political corruption charges. It couldn't be because he's the crime minister, as, you know, even aspects of the Israeli, you know, electorate call him. He actually is a crime minister, and his political corruption is just the lowest form of his criminality. Very true, very true. It- all right, back to page 187. It's Marda of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, the first allegation against Netanyahu involves him secretly colluding with a foreign billionaire, Australian entrepreneur James Packer, to advance his own interests. The second allegation submits that Netanyahu attempted to secretly collude with top Trump donor Sheldon Adelson in an effort to manipulate media coverage. I believe that's this is in an Israeli uh, context, like Israel Hayom, I think. And the third allegation, like the second, involves an attempt at clandestine collusion with the telecommunications and media conglomerate. Unquote. I just want to add in that, that a key character here who is uh, implicated in these uh, corruption charges against Netanyahu is Arnon Milchan, producer of Oliver Stone's JFK and the, the, the Israel man, long-term uh, Lacom operative, probably in certain ways like uh, he w- was actually working in a parallel fashion to w- and then also after Robert Maxwell. Both Shimon Perez, uh, you know, LACOM Bureau of uh, Scientific Relations, I think it's called. It's basically the uh, Israeli Technological Espionage Division. It helped birth the uh, Israeli nuclear program, but also helped birth the the, uh, the growth of Israel as the second eye, as Bibi would call it, but hoping to be the global uh, power in uh, cyber technology, cyber weaponry. Uh, back doors into critical infrastructure uh, in all of that. And uh, and then James Packer even has, has long, there's a long relationship with uh, Milchan and uh, James Packer from uh, Australia. Also uh, business partners with uh, Steve Mnuchin, the uh, Treasury Secretary under Trump. So, Very good point. And actually the the show that we did, I think called Trump in the Media or something like that from 2017, might uh, cover uh, some of these areas, including Mnuchin. All right. Back to the text, page 187 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, Consequently, while Netanyahu has not to date been linked with his former top aide's attempt to possibly illegally connect an Israeli company specializing in telecommunications and media strategy with the Trump campaign, 
Neither can it be said that such an act of collusion would lie outside Netanyahu's reputed sphere of activity. And unquote. And I do also want to point out that I am positive that I read an article. I cannot find uh, the reference anymore, but I'm positive I read an article quoting a member of the Knesset who uh, ba basically saying, uh, like, really worried about the recognition that Netanyahu had gotten the Israeli government involved in the Trump operation and that they were worried about the fallout. I'm positive I, I read this, and I wish I could uh, find it. I'll, I'll, I'll look some more. So, and of course, so obviously there's the circumstantial evidence surrounding all of this. He's at the head of the government. He's a secret, for, he's a special forces operative. He's known to be involved in intelligence o operations. He's basically notorious now for being the veto guy, the yes, the up or down on the question of delivering cyber weapons like NSO's Pegasus software to, uh, to other countries. So and 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 his like you know close guy is his Rahm Emanuel Birnbaum is involved with this. The circumstantial evidence, is, I think you could I think you could convict at a criminal level, but the fact that they I am aware that there was actually like direct Knesset level chatter, worrying and knowing of the prime minister's involvement in uh, in. Uh, inserting uh, himself into the U.S. election on behalf of this guy and the politics behind that, that that was a concern of the potential political diplomatic fallout. Uh, I think you have a, a sort of, uh, you know, people have been convicted of murder for less. All right. Middle of page 187, uh, Proof of Conspiracy by Abramson. Quote, as for whether interference by Zamel and Psy Group in the 2016 election offers some additional evidence of involvement by the Israeli government, worth noting is a New York Times report confirming that Psy Group is indeed, quote, staffed by former Israeli intelligence operatives, unquote. The Daily Beast and the Times of Israel have both reported that not just Gates, but two members of, quote, Trump's inner circle, unquote, reached out to Psy Group looking for election assistance. The names of these top-level Trump aides are at present unknown. What is known is that Zamel was so determined to get to Trump, he, quote, even asked Newt Gingrich, the former House Speaker, to offer Zamel services to Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law, unquote. Gingrich was at the time a member of Psy Group's advisory board, as was Elliot Abrams, a man Trump has since named as a special envoy, quote, to oversee U.S. policy toward Venezuela, unquote, per The New Yorker. Gingrich forwarded Zamel's May 2016 email to Jared Kushner. As already noted, Kushner's family is close to Netanyahu. You don't say, sleeping in his childhood bed when Netanyahu would visit the Kushner family. Quote, and it is Kushner who ultimately decides over objections from both Corey Lewandowski and Paul Manafort to hire Cambridge Analytica, a decision that may well have meant, too, hiring an Israeli business intelligence firm run by Zamel. Zamel, for his part, admired, quote, Trump's vocal support for Israel and his hardline views on Iran, unquote, according to The New Yorker saying in his email to Gingrich that ended up in Kushner's inbox that Psy Group could, quote, provide the Trump campaign with powerful tools that would use social media to advance Trump's chances. Zamel suggested a meeting in Washington to discuss the matter further, unquote. I was just thinking this would be something for uh, Ye to talk about the next time he brings up Kushner and the Kushner influence over uh, Trump and all, so many other things, but I guess he won't do that. Yeah, get specific. What did Kushner do? But of course, see, the thing about this is, is that this is way more replete than just Kushner. These are just the emails that we have available. This is what we know about, right? And this whole thing is a clandestine operation to some extent. So this is the surface level of it. And I just want to remind folks that I continue to think that like the tri tripartite conceptual structure 
that I propose for bo- and understanding both 9-11 and 11-9 is crucial in terms of getting our facts uh, analyzed properly and put it, maybe put in the right place. You have an intelligence operation which constructs like is both the uh, construction of, uh, of the narrative, which in this, in the 11-9 operation is so obviously about, you know, n- painting the PR operation surrounding Trump, uh, the neuro-linguistic programming operations, the Cambridge Analytica, uh, you know, uh, data, big data operations, um, all of that. But then also then how he's being, you know, the direct intelligence operation that's being described here in terms of how to work the minds over on the uh, potential voters. That's part of an intelligence operation, right? That's uh, intelligence. Then you have counterintelligence, which means that, which in a, the traditional way of understanding it is how do you protect your intelligence operations, counter or against other people's intelligence operations. In this case, it would be public public interest, public intelligence, where we're working to understand what actually happened, who did what and why. Then you'd have a counterintelligence operation to cover it up. And it's the extent, the effective extent of the count, ongoing counterintelligence operation to protect 11-9 that is part of what, what in my gut makes me think that, like, we really need to understand the actual aspects of these other parts of the 11-9 operation. So you have intelligence, counterintelligence, and then you have a military operation. Military operation is very readily seen in terms of terrorist attacks or deep uh, actual what we really traditionally know as deep state operations or deep political operations, such as assassinations or uh, terrorist attacks where there's Ex- explosions and people dying, right? That is, you, you, that doesn't depend on the intelligence operation. The intelligence operation is usually used to then uh, facilitate the actual end result of the military operation, operation. And in the case of a false flag operation, it's used to cloak it, both cloak it and then also then uh, direct the, uh, the blowback, the response of the actual military operation onto the target of the intelligence operation. So in a military operation, in terms of elections, you're talking about how do you actually know that you're going to, quote unquote, get the votes that you need in the states that you need them on top of all of these intelligence operations that are being run. In terms of a 9-11, the military operation is how do you make sure that, uh, uh, you know, that the these planes hit buildings and these buildings go boom and everything it, this, it, it goes up in pyroclastic flows of uh, micronized dust and people's bodies basically disappear in many cases in terms of ground zero. Okay, that's the military component. How do you know that the operation will actually, that it will actually be deployed correctly, that the target will be, will be met? All right, so military, intelligence, and counterintelligence. And I think that structure helps us a lot with any time we're really dealing with something that's uh, deep and deep in terms of politically deep, deep politics, deep state, but also then complex, which a lot of this really is because you got to remember you have both intelligence and counterintelligence involved, so there's a lot of trickery, a lot of deception, a lot of sleight of hand, a lot of red herrings, a lot of fingers pointing in one direction rather than another, a lot of uh, mudding the waters or, you know, releasing the, the you know, the, the shit, flood the zone with shit in the very sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> grotesque wordage of uh, the stones and the bannons. All right. So I think that that will help us clarify these waters. All right. All right, we're back to top of page 188 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, Kushner thereafter discussed the idea with Brad Parscale, then Trump's digital campaign director. Subsequently, Rick Gates requested that Zamel send additional proposals to the campaign, which the Israeli business intelligence expert did in June. 
In June 2016, the same month Zamel sends three full-length social media disinformation campaign proposals to the Trump team, the Israeli businessman meets with MBZ advisor Mohammed bin Zayed advisor George Nader, whom he has known for years, having been introduced by former Dick Cheney aide John Hanna. At the very economic forum in St. Petersburg that Felix Sater had been trying to get Michael Cohen to attend, and that Deripaska associate and Russian deputy prime minister Sergei Prodolko, Prodolko had invited Trump to attend on two separate occasions. In St. Petersburg, Zamel tells Nader that he is, quote, trying to raise money for a social media campaign in support of Trump, unquote, an entreaty strongly suggesting that the Trump campaign was willing to use Zamel's work, but not to pay for it directly, and that Zamel had reason to believe Nader's patron, MBZ, for whom Zamel was already a consultant, would be willing to secretly do so. And indeed, according to The New Yorker, Zamel ultimately does ask Nader for, quote, Nader's Gulf contacts to contribute financially, unquote. According to the Times of Israel, one of the three campaigns Psy Group proposes to the Trump t- team in June 2016 in response to contact with multiple top campaign advisors suggests, quote, using fake online profiles to, bo- to bombard targets with messages, unquote that appear to come from American voters and de- decry Trump opponents, quote, ul- ulterior motives or hidden plans, unquote. Meanwhile, a second proposal solicited by the Trump campaign would use an identical, identical strategy to, quote, target female minorities in swing states to push them toward Trump and away from Clinton, unquote. A third proposal, quote, sketches out a months-long plan to help Trump by using social media to help expose or amplify division among rival campaigns and factions, unquote. An idea that dovetails with the Kremlin's effort to suppress Democratic turnout in November 2016 by exacerbating divisions between supporters of Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and Jill Stein. These proposals, submitted formally to the Trump campaign in the spring and summer of 2016, under the codename Project Rome, are thus substantively indistinguishable from the interference the Kremlin was orchestrating during the general election. That Psy Group knows the activities it proposes to Gates and two other tr- top Trump aides will have to be covert is confirmed by its proposals using code words for Trump and Clinton and discussing the need for, quote, intelligence activities, unquote, which the proposals explicitly contrast with, quote, open source methods, unquote, for the plans to come off, to come off properly. Just a reminder, once again, this is way more than just Facebook messages from uh, maybe some type of company or offshoot of something that has a connection to a hot dog vendor who once catered to Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And, but by the way, These are all multi-million dollar campaigns, and that's just the known money aspect of it. And again, like the, the, the point is that the burn bomb being this key connector of all this, the direct connection to Netanyahu, and I would say now what we know about the reporting of Netanyahu being obviously the ultimate decider of, uh, of Israeli, uh, you know, military intelligence unit 8200, uh, technological spinoffs now under a corporate uh, banner such as NSO said not to be an actual uh, state, um, you know, company. That Netanyahu is the one who signs off on the use of these cyber tools and cyber weapons in when he's in power. Okay, and of course that's that's actually one of the more unique aspects of the Israeli state. Is, is the combination of the, uh, you know, the conscription of the, of the you know, that all, uh, that all uh, Israeli citizens are required to serve in the military and combined with that with all of these long-term special programs that they have going, such as the Talpiot program, to create an actual technological edge 
on what they see as their uh, enemies, opponents, nemeses, uh, rivals, all of that, combined with all that we know now in terms of the 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 nature of how far Israeli cyber power has gone in a corporate mode in terms of uh, corporate insertions, whether it's a, a Adalom inserted into Microsoft Azure Cloud or Microsoft being coded in uh, in Israel to to a large extent in the large transfer of uh, of Silicon Valley companies uh, into the Silicon Wadi, uh, and then all of that that uh, stands behind that. So the, the that combination there makes it a fairly uh, unique operation. Plus the fact that that Israel has a lot of state owned companies. Additionally recognized state-owned companies. Sometimes they they go into private hands, such as, um, what's it called, the Israel Corporation? Is that, the, I think the, that's what it's called? Um, that, sh- that used to be uh, majority owned by the state of Israel, then sort of went into private hands. I think Shaul Eisenberg, um, a ho- there's a whole history there of just looking into that one company, which, by the way, uh, is, I believe, the parent company of Zim Zim Shipping Company, which is one a little crucial piece of circumstantial evidence of, at the very least, uh, Israeli state knowledge of the coming 9-11 attack, where that, uh, you know, state origin, let's say, uh, company Zim Shipping moved, broke its lease in the World Trade Center, I believe, uh, in just the weeks before uh, September 11th uh, and, and faced a, uh, you know, a penalty to do so. When when you combine that with the Odigo warning messages and all of that, and there's so much more, obviously, including urban, uh, all of the moving companies, the Israeli intelligence front surrounding the entire operation, there's tons of uh, evidence there. And then on, as we pointed out over and over again, Netanyahu talking to the recently uh, acquired uh, owner of the World Trade Center 1 and 2 uh, property in just the weeks before September 11th, Larry Silverstein talking every Sunday up up through and beyond September 11th. So this is th- there's this is way more extensive than what we know from, you know, some largely limited scope of uh, certain journalistic inquiries, but mainly, you know, little aspects of the limited hangout of the uh, of the Mueller investigation, and because actually, um, I believe Abramson published proof of conspiracy in 2019 before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, Volume Five inquiry on the counterintelligence aspects of the uh, Trump inquiry was released, even. So this is mainly from, you know, limited Mueller uh, uh, releases and journalism surrounding it. And remember who uh, defined and limited the scope of the Mueller investigation? The NSO <laughs> Pegasus Associated Lawyer after he was the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who said he could land the plane in this case. He was the one who uh, named Mueller and then defined and limited the scope of the inquiry into Trump Russia. And in, in a way that also seemed to be, make it uh, uh, so that there could only be a, uh, a, uh, a, a criminal, a high level criminal uh, complaint against um, the high level uh, perpetrators in relationship to something called collusion, right? Which is legally undefined, but which seems to imply conspiracy, which is very diff- is actually difficult to prove, right? So there's tons of criminality uh, proven out in the Mueller report. There's, what, some 10, just in the part two, what, 10 instances of obstruction of justice? That's not a minor charge, obstruction of justice, there's 10, 10, I think there's 10 uh, cases of obstruction of justice laid out in part two. Meanwhile, there's tons of evidence pointing to collusion, quote unquote, uh, in the first part. But because you have Rod Rosenstein limiting and defining the scope of this, 
to definitely not involve his buddies in Israel, and definitely not involve things such as like Israeli military intelligence cutouts, such as Psy Group or NSO Group and all the whole, uh, you know, uh, wash of those. So this is just the tip of the intelligence iceberg that we know about that, that Abramson is writing about here. And this is before the release of about a thousand pages of, uh, of different uh, facts, some of which actually then go directly into this Israeli connection in the Senate Select uh, Committee for Intelligence, Volume 5 Counterintelligence Report, right? And actually, that's, that is when I interviewed Abramson for the Understanding Israel-Palestine show on KKFI, was uh, after I'd read some of this book and I saw the implications in terms of the question of uh, Israel-Palestine and U.S.-Israel relations and Palestinian politics uh, and all of that, and then immediately after the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, um, uh, uh, f- uh, Volume 5 uh, report had been released, and to specifically deal with like the drawing together of his previous investigation in Volume 1, which was primarily addressed towards domestic and Russian players in the Trump operation to this one, which is primarily uh, focused around the what he calls the Red Sea conspiracy, a yacht conspiracy, uh, specifically around the Middle East, obviously, uh, and, uh, uh, and so to, to try to draw those together. And, and he did explain how the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence Volume 5 report had actually helped helped explain certain things that he didn't understand before and filled in certain uh, pieces of evidence. Um, you were correct, Jeremy. Uh, Proof of Conspiracy was published on September 3rd, 2019, and the Volume 5 report was not published until August 18th of 2020. So there's nearly a year overlap there. So you were correct about that. All right. Thanks, Greg. All right, so I just, I just really wanted to point out that even in the, this is sort of why we like to give context too is to, that when we're reading you know uh, books that are published and uh, based on largely uh, you know uh, government released documents and uh, a curation of published journalism uh, that that this is just what we publicly sort of can likely confirm about one piece of this operation of the the election intelligence operation, we might say. And there's these, you know, there's a lot of the counterintelligence operation that's missing because it's ongoing, the cover up. But then there's also the military, the military grade operation, the military intelligence operation, I would even say, uh, that is, uh, that is, uh, ensures that the target uh, is, uh, is reached, that is totally missing from this. Part of it by necessity because he's working from these published documents. All right. We are on middle of page 189 of Proof of Conspiracy by Seth Abramson. Quote, the Psy Group knows that the activities of proposal to Gates and two other t- top Trump aides will have to be covert. Oh, that Psy Group knows the activities it proposes to Gates and two other top Trump aides will be have to be co- covert is confirmed by its proposals using code word code words for Trump and Clinton and discussing the need for quote intelligence activities unquote which the proposals explicitly contrast with quote open source methods unquote for the plans to come off properly. One plan even discusses using, quote, clandestine means to build, quote, unquote, intelligence dossiers on Clinton, unquote, a strategy that mirrors the one the Trump campaign will accuse the Clinton campaign of using once the Steele dossier, which outlines serious allegations of Trump-Russia collusion, is published in January 2017 by BuzzFeed News. That Psy, Gro- uh, that Psy Group knows its proposals are illegal appears to be confirmed by a subsequent Times of Israel investigation, which finds that Psy Group, quote, was reportedly told by an American law firm that its activities would be illegal if non-Americans were involved, unquote. The top brass at Psy Group, including Zamel himself, are all foreign nationals. Moreover, the Times of Israel will note that in at least one other sphere, Anti-BDS, boycott, divest, sanction Israel campaigns 
Psy Group is working covertly overseas in a way that is, quote, known to the Israeli government and specifically the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, unquote. A full unquote there. And two things I want to point out. One is that I forgot to mention that the another parallel piece of evidence that this is very likely signed off on directly, if not directly overseen by Netanyahu and not just some sort of off-the-shelf corporate cutout you know, uh, guys who decided to reach out to the Trump campaign uh, and, and all that, is the parallel process of uh, Ehud Barak, the former prime minister, the former head of Israeli military intelligence, the former head of the Israeli military, uh, being the one to connect Harvey Weinstein with the another Israeli intelligence cutout, Black Cube, which is more human, uh, human intelligence, human-based. Now, Psy Group seems to be a mix, I'll bet. It's sort of human, but it's also SIGINT a little bit, right? There's a, probably a combination of cyber and human intelligence involved in what they're doing. Now, Black Cube was primarily human intelligence with probably a little bit of, uh, you know, SIGINT, cyber uh, support or something like that. To, for Barack to help Harvey Weinstein cover up his uh, sexual crimes against uh, women and to uh, intimidate them, to surveil them, to surveil journalists who are trying to, uh, to intimidate journalists, run operations against journalists that were trying to uh, expose uh, Harvey Weinstein's uh, operations, right? So I think that's another example where you have someone who was at the highest levels of Israeli uh, state and military and intelligence power being the one to connect uh, a, 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 an ally or someone they were trying to aid with this quote unquote corporate Israeli corporate cutout uh, services that are all manned by all the quote unquote veteran or ex uh, Mossad, right? As everybody knows, you know, once CIA, always CIA, once Mossad, always Mossad. And it's especially true in an Israeli context as the, the, it, it's set up, their cyber power is set up by an outgrowth, a direct outgrowth, with the Talpio program being the most explicit example of it, of where you start in, in uh, military and intelligence, and you serve for a while, and then maybe you continue there, or maybe you go then into the academy, and you act as an academician, or a scientist, or an engineer, or the third track from the Talpiot program, all emanating out of a special Israeli military intelligence program, is to then go into the corporate sector to start a company. It's all Israeli military intelligence. No matter what path you choose at that, after your first original service in Israeli military and intelligence. So this is crucial to understand. This is all, I'll just say, it would, obviously this was not only signed off on, this is not like just some kind of, you know, giving, uh, you know, some country the Pegasus software where it's basically Netanyahu saying, yeah, yeah, let's do it. And then he'll use it for diplomatic uh, leverage uh, either before or after in relationship to the UN, uh, votes, economic relations. But this is very likely, this is, these are Netanyahu's people. These are Netanyahu's people. He's managed, he's probably over, very carefully overseeing this. This is very likely why the chatter in the Knesset was, holy smokes, dude, are we really doing this? This is supposedly our, you know, our uh, greatest ally, our greatest patron in the world, and we're going to go uh, support this guy who, uh, the nephew of the founder, uh, one of the founders of Israel, uh, uh, the uh, then head of uh, NBC, was it CBS? Um, Les Moonves. Les Moonves. Trump may not be good for America, but he's good for us. Good for CBS in good particular. For CBS. Yes, <laughs> You're you. right. And, then, uh, and Les, Les Moonves went on to be uh, Me too uh, in the um, aftermath of a Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Moonves is one of the people who uh, believe um, what was, was caught up in the Me Too uh, one of the names of people that came out and were exposed. But uh, following up on what you're saying there, this is um, this is very interesting here with the uh, with Netanyahu and the um, the la the disapproval of going along with this by other Israelis. It what it indicates at at the very um, 
at the very uh, best, um, it one indicator, one possibility to take from this is that these people knew the potential damage that this would pose to the quote unquote special relationship, especially if it's seen as like being partisan, not just to um, not just to one political party, but of a very, very obviously um, political movement that was moving in a very um, different direction, even from traditional, usual um, Republican business as usual politics. That's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it is that, um, and it, there's some overlap here, but, but another way to look at it is that despite all of this, um, Netanyahu and whatever network on an international scale he's affiliated with and is working on behalf of and conjunction with did not care about the damage and uh you could even even regardless of the motivations or motives of certain people within um israel to uh, uh positions of influence to oppose this uh plan and to even make their concerns to netanyahu known um, regardless of what the uh, motivations are for that concern um i think a case could be made that it looks like that the that this network um, netanyahu is representing on an international scale did not really seem to care or take into consideration the the um the implications of this for the special relationship remember wasn't it um america is something that can easily be moved right um, yes, if i recall yes. and and plus netanyahu had already come in and uh even with the previous uh, gop leadership that um that were that Trump, I guess, was too much for it ended up leaving as a result of people like John Bader uh, already had come in and already actively um, spat in the face, basically, uh, metaphor or um, figuratively spat in the face of the sitting American president by shaming him about um, nuclear diplomacy. I mean, there and then, of course, uh, on top of what we talked about, the advocacy for the Iraq war and even the even September 11th itself, um, you know, this is a person who uh, I think becomes increasingly clear, um, at least. Uh, to me, it seems like just doesn't have any regard or doesn't care about what the consequences are going to be for this special relationship that these other uh, other Israelis might be concerned about because Netanyahu and the forces around him don't see the U.S. Israel relationship. I don't believe they see it in the same context as the um, as it's traditionally talked about in terms like bipartisan American politics and all of this and the lip service to that relationship. And I think um, consequences be damned. We're doing this because this is what we're going to do and we're not going to be stopped. That's my my impression. Definitely. And I, I also want to point out that the the idiocy that is represented by uh, folks that continue and I, it's weaponized idiocy in terms of the reception of it, I'd say, of those who would continue to either deny the 11-9 operation or lie about the 11-9 operation to, in order to obscure it. That this is, this is idiotic. The people at the commanding heights of a lot of these countries that were involved know exactly what, what happened. Or they have a good sense of that something happened, not a, a quote-unquote conspiracy that was made up by Rachel Maddow or something like that. This is bragged about in like, you know, on TV in Russia in certain ways. This is the highest levels of some of these governments were involved in this, including then a, a significant and powerful cell in the United States of America. It's 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 idiot. It's weaponized idiocy to deny that this all happened. What we need to figure out is how it happened, why it happened, and who all did it, and then how we can fix it. Similar to ongoing uh, deal with September 11th, we haven't fixed it. We got to figure it out. Our politics are being destroyed, and along along with that. Our, our chance to, uh, uh, you know, approach all of our other crises that are just accumulating here and around the world. And uh, just a reminder that the quote unquote 9-11 truth movement has for the, I'd say a significant portion of it has regressed big time with regards to um, all of these developments as the uh, is now um, totally. I mean, to say they're behind the eight ball with regards to, I'd say, um, the, certainly not just the geopolitics of 2016, but then all the consequences that come with it and the you know, the Russian sphere influence, the you can even say the Iranian sphere sphere influence. Um, there to say they're beyond they're behind the eight ball at this point is way um is is 
I think, an understatement. You could even make an argument that the aforementioned Rachel Maddow is problematic as she is, that people who tune into a program like hers are probably might and know more about the elements of like the real world as it relates to some of this than people in the aforementioned quote 9-11 truth movement who have totally regressed to a um to a very um severe uh level to where now i think that uh that the as far as even losing the plot as far as the september 11th goes because now they find themselves knowingly unknowingly in many cases i think uh ultimately serving the same agenda knowingly or unknowingly as elements of the direct perpetrators of the September 11th operation via the playing down a collusion buying into certain foreign policy geopolitical narratives and uh and so i i get the sense that um it's my belief and i know i think we share this belief that um the people who should be at the forefront of like of understanding uh, these deep political um realities have just regressed beyond um to a very severe level, and uh, that to I think that some of the people who might have been some of the most prescient analysts a number of years ago are now just um, they've fallen behind people, a lot of people who take in uh, mainstream media sources, and I think that that's an unfortunate reality in many cases. Very much, very much so. I mean, it's the I'd say the there's a bulk of what you have the 9-11 truth movement or 9-11 truthers who uh, not only missed have missed this, like mo- I, most to all, to, most to many to all have never even are, are not even aware that there, a concept of 11-9 even exists as describing a deep political event uh, that happened and is the wake at the very least is, and the cover up is ongoing about. But some is even worse, like you're pointing out. They have, uh, they are continuing to actively uh, lie and deceive and cover up eleven nine. Now, and at the same time, I agree with you. Like as as you know, uh, problematic as you know what quote unquote trutherism might be, and nine eleven trutherism, if you want to talk about it, it's basically a uh, a disinformed. Uh, simplification in many ways that uh, will often serve to uh, muddy the waters and dissuade uh, certain people, other sort of thinking people from looking at the uh, core of the evidence uh, and getting people to look away from the uh, more credible evidence, let's say. That the sort of, the average core of the 9-11 truthers, let's say, are way less informed in just the sort of general scope of of eleven nine truthers. Let's say trutherism, you know, uh, in terms of like the av- You're right. The average Rachel Maddow viewer, I would say, is likely more closer to eleven nine trutherism than the average nine eleven truther. Actually, at some level, even though they got they got disinformed and hung out super limited you didn't hear anything about they never had seth abramson on you heard nothing about the middle east connection really almost at all um and uh let alone how deep it went into the united states so i think you're right greg i think you're right yeah and they're also not susceptible to they're also not as susceptible to the ongoing as we continue to talk about war on culture which goes hand in glove with this and they're not um you know at the very least they're not out there promoting uh matt walsh documentaries uh (laughs) as these um as important uh truth truth seeking um inquiries into what a man and what a woman really is and so uh there's also in addition to that there's not near near there's a big gap in terms of like the types of um when it comes to things like that as well and of course that's part of this because it goes hand in glove with 11.9 11.9 and the geopolitical elements around it and the type of people who who put in place 11.9 and benefit from it and also the desires to um, to really do as much damage domestically to the overall um, society of society and of the um, of the to continue further eroding um, our institutions in any type of uh, unity and things that could bring people in our society together who benefit from these uh from these narratives in place of as far as um the the QAnon and then the 
continuity of it through anybody who uh, believes that people who identify as uh, trans deserve basic human rights is equivalent to wanting to either a literal wanting to groom your children to be violated by by satanic pedophiles. I mean, the the types of things are not even on. I don't think they're even in the same uh, uh, close to the same wavelength at this point in terms of the types of narratives that have taken prevalence in many areas of what once was, yeah, very still problematic and weaponized, but pretty effective at one point, that quote unquote 9-11 truth movement. Definitely. And there, there's a lot more to this chapter, Greg. So I think we should uh, draw it to a close here for now and come back to it and finish the other half uh, of what's left here um, on our, whenever we can, basically. Um, if that's okay with you. But I do want to make one last point in terms of what we just read about how the, uh, I'm going to read this last uh, piece here. Quote, the top brass at Psy Group, including Zamel himself, are all foreign nationals. Moreover, the Times of Israel will note that in at least one other sphere, anti-BDS, boycott, divest, sanction Israel campaigns, Psy Group is working covertly overseas in a way that is, quote, known to the Israeli government, and specifically the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, unquote. And I want to make a couple of points about that. One is looping back to Ye. You know what the other like key word in this domain and key words in this domain that he hasn't said, I believe, in relationship to uh, alongside Israel, is Palestine, Palestinians. You would think, you would think if he was a smart movement builder at the very least— if not morally cogent, that he would bring in uh, the people who have been the most targeted over decades and decades and decades and decades and decades and decades and decades decades by both Jewish power and Jewish state power. In that case, Zionist power. And that's still totally missing. And here you go. This is not only more evidence that this is an... Uh, uh, an Israeli uh, state-sponsored program being uh, pushed to the Trump people. But that this is also then uh, tied into the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. Very likely. There's a working relationship there, at the very least. A covert working relationship with Psy Group, with the Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which I would say are the they are the ministry that deals with the information war or the civil war or this global civil war you might even or the global civilian war they're they're the ones whose leaders have called for the civil the civil assassination of people uh, including professor berkeley professors who are support boycott divestment sanctions uh, in relationship to palestinian solidarity they've called directly for civil assassinations Now, we know already from the long history here, there's an assassination complex uh, in relationship to Israel and how it manages its quote-unquote Palestinian problem worldwide. So this is what we're dealing with. This is also the Ministry of Strategic Affairs. That's also Avigdor Lieberman's uh, uh, former spot, too. This is the group that works to to, uh, take down any effective campaign that might hold the Israeli state to account for its oppression, the ongoing oppression of the Palestinian people. And this is this group who worked covertly for this ministry are the ones that are being pushed uh, for Trump there. Yeah, so that, that, that connection, I think, is, is crucial. The, both the ministry itself, the background of Lieberman, who then is also then appears to be tied in to Manafort uh, trucking and bartering in uh, U- Ukrainian uh, information warfare uh, and accusations of anti-Semitism in relationship to Hillary Clinton. And again, he just trucked right into Breitbart and Ben Shapiro at the time. And that seems to be going through Avigdor Lieberman, Ministry of Strategic Affairs. So that's another little parallel there. All right. Sorry, Greg, you had something to say. Oh, no, you're fine. I was just saying that uh, Palestine is another topic that um, is not going to be um, – that there's not going to be anything uh, – not likely to be anything worthwhile coming out of as a result of being closely associated first with your red-pilled 
Candace Owens who red pills you and then <laughs> Nick Fuentes who comes in and picks up picks up on that afterwards. Like they're not going to provide a very – that combination is not going to provide any type of a constructive dialogue on Palestine. Because let's even remember Nick Fuentes. Oh, yeah, yeah, Israel bad. But meanwhile, um, there's um, – there, I mean even some of these alt-right type of people will try to profess like a, a solidarity with the persecuted, um, pressed – Palestinians who are suffering under the hand of the, you know, the Jewish global Zionist um, regime or whatnot. But these these types here, like they, I really think they're more in the category of they just don't care one way or the other. And so that's like you. So now, like this is even like I don't think there's even so much as like the professed um, lip service to the cause of Palestine here. I think it's more of a sense of like you're getting into people here who really, will publicly uh, have this idea of this profession that they just don't care so that's even so now that's where i think uh someone like kanye is going from from philo-semitic we don't care to so quote unquote anti-semitic anti-jewish we don't care that's a good point yeah i mean this is the another infamous clip of uh nick fuentes is him sort of making fun of our jog situation here by calling it a worse than a Middle Eastern bazaar. We're basically in Africa and saying we're the the N wordification and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, so they he doesn't uh, he he might even think the Palestinians are below the Jews. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but this is who Yay. What an asshole, Yay, dude. This is who you're hooked up with, man. You've like a deep. I can tell you have a deep constructive art artist's heart but you gotta get you gotta get uh remember uh you gotta get focused on jesus walks over wait till i get my money right he lost the path get, get, you better get you better get woke for real yay you're in with some bad dudes this is really creepy all right hopefully yay finds a better path yeah, uh, real quick, I was going to read one thing here, just real quick. Uh, um, something that came out just today. Netanyahu says it was a mistake for Trump to dine with Kanye. Turns out he said that in an interview with Barry Weiss. So Barry Weiss. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, quote, quote, I condemned Kanye West's anti-Semitic statements. President Trump's decision to dine with this person I think is wrong and misplaced. He shouldn't do that. I think he made a mistake. I hope it's not repeated. Also, though, when asked to describe Trump with one adjective, Netanyahu chose irreverent. And then also that credit, that one very light, very, very, very slight slap on the wrist type of quote unquote criticism was also um, surrounded by Netanyahu touting Trump's Trump and how much he's been supportive of Israel and this unabashed appreciation of Trump's actions for Israel and the the embassy decision in the Golan Heights sovereignty in the Iran deal. So basically that's, that's amounts to honestly, that amounts to less than a slap on the wrist if you ask me. Oh yeah. How much, how much has Netanyahu ever said like, you know, thank you, Donald Trump for how much you've done for the Jews. Maybe he's never quite used that language, but it's, he's close to that. I feel like, um, and by the way, it's, that's interesting. Barry Weiss with the access to journalism with Netanyahu it was the same day that I went on the higher side chats to uh, expose FC Maxwell, Talpiot program, uh, a lot of historical stuff. The same day that Barry Weiss went on Joe Rogan to get all uh, flustered about her Zionism and stuff. So, um, yeah. And then oh, one little piece that we forgot to mention last time was that the Hinkle, when, when Jackson Hinkle brought up the thing about uh, at least Netanyahu coming into power will be good for the multipolar world order, the coming multipolar world order because of his great working relationship with Putin and Xi. Um, he was actually responding to his interview, the people criticizing him for his interview with Jordan Peterson because Peterson had just been with Netanyahu. So that was that's an interesting piece there, I feel like. So I don't know. Maybe Netanyahu, Net, maybe Netanyahu and Ye will have a conference, and they can, uh, you know, Crips versus the Bloods, bang on wax, and some kind of fake uh, Jewish Zionist versus uh, Christian Zionist eleven nine ongoing Opstein thing. All right. On that note, I think we'll uh, come back to this. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Thank you, Greg. 
Thanks, everybody. Antidote, we are out. Thank you.